Welcome to our exciting animal welfare series, Action for Animals. We're teaming up with the animal advocacy group, Action for Animals Barbados, and we're seeking to educate, to enlighten, but most definitely to promote the best animal care for our animals here on the island. We've had some interesting discussions on bees, we saw surgery the last time when a dog was being spayed and we certainly got quite a few interesting comments about that, that one and people not really realizing that that's what went into it. So now you know. And today our focus switches to the ocean and to our shores and to a beloved visitor to our island, the turtle. And you know, our turtles are under threat and today we're going to take a look at the important work of the Barbados Sea Turtle Project and their passionate field director, Carla Daniel. Carla actually is on the beach when we get an idea of just what the sand looks like when a turtle has made a nest. So this is a Hawksville sea turtle nest and the baby turtles are just at the surface uh, sleeping until later tonight when it cools down and then they're going to come up and make their way into the ocean. So because they're, they are so close to the surface, the heads were actually exposed. I have put a bit of sand over the top and I'm going to get some stones and just make a ring around it, hopefully so that people won't trod on their heads. Now this is one of the reasons why it is important not to drive on our beaches because when these baby turtles get close to the surface, they are sometimes less than an inch from the surface and other times they are half out of the sand and they're camouflaged. And as you drive along the sand, you can easily crush them and kill them as they sleep waiting to emerge after dark. Getting some flat rocks to put on the front so that if they come out, they can crawl over them pretty easily. Now, I am being very optimistic. This one is full of ants. I'm being very optimistic when I talk about them coming up and crawling down to the sea. Because sadly, this location is one where the hatchlings are disoriented by light the majority of the time. And they emerge on this beach, head inland across the gravel car park and straight into the road and at times almost the entire nest is crushed. The ones that are not crushed and luckily make it across fall down into the cement canal only to be trapped and starve to death over time. In this particular instance this is a bit of a difficult case because it is a combination of lights that are causing the disorientation. So we have lights from uh, private businesses. There's actually Jordan's supermarket Although not directly opposite the beach, the building is tall and the lights are out the roof line of the second story. So those lights are visible from the beach. And then we have the street lights, of course. And there are a couple other buildings and businesses across the road. So it is actually a problem with multiple, um, multiple sources. The first one is to get sea turtle friendly street lights. And there's sea turtle friendly street lights in Puerto Rico, in Costa Rica, close by in uh, Antigua as well. There are a number of islands that have sought to adjust their lighting to reduce the mortality of the hatchlings. We have uh, talked to the Barbados Light and Power. They have brought in test lights. They have been assessed by the police and by other agencies. And we have uh, decided upon a light that is just a little bit more orange than usual. It's actually not 
that much um, different to our regular light. You're still able to see, but the places that we really want to get these installed are actually on beaches. You may not be aware, but there are quite a few beaches that have street lights on the beach. We're not speaking about highways or main roads or anything. Uh, street lights on the beach itself. So those are basically the low hanging fruit and those are the lights we would like to tackle first. It is critically important in Barbados, over 95% of all of the hatchlings that emerge on our beaches become disoriented and need to be rescued. In 2021, the Barbados Sea Turtle Project rescued 63,265 hatchlings. And if I'm honest, that really is probably a tiny fraction of the number that needed to be saved. Thousands of hatchlings die every year, and these are not easy deaths. They are eaten by predators as they go in the direction that is brightest, which would naturally have been the water if this was an undeveloped island, because the water is always brighter than the land, even when there is no moon water reflects whatever light is there. So they would emerge from the nest after digging for three to five days to get to the surface. They emerge, they look around, they have very specially adapted eyes so they can see very, very well. They look around and they go in the direction that is brightest. And on that mystical undeveloped island, that is always the water. So they come up, they turn and they go straight for the sea and they are scrambling and scurrying. They are the quickest thing that you can imagine. They are not, you know, stereotypically slow. They are very fast and they make their way to the sea, evading crabs and other predators. Of course, they probably get a few, but they head straight to the water and begin. And that is really the beginning of their journey. Now, the very act of crawling away from the beach, away from the sea. And in some cases, do you see how close this nest is? This nest is literally, these baby turtles are literally on the edge of the water. The water is right here. And what is likely to happen is that they will emerge and they will crawl over 100 meters in the wrong direction. Now, when these hatchlings emerge from their eggs, they have a remnant yolk. Let's say baby chickens, this tiny amount of yolk that is left back is used to fuel their journey. They use up about half of this energy source in that three to five days that they spend digging through the sand to get to the surface. And the other half is supposed to help them to make their way safely to the water and then swim way past the reef, straight out into the horizon. It is only after they've gotten away from land and they found Sargassum, which is basically going to be their floating home that they're finally safe and shortly after that they're able to pause and to start eating. Sargassum has an entire ecosystem associated with it. There's sargassum fish and crabs and shrimp and all kinds of things but not just that sargassum is a nursery for a lot of juvenile fish for juvenile eels and there's an entire food chain that is linked to the sargassum. Now, these baby turtles will settle in this sargassum and float around for four to six years. And then it is only when they are a bit bigger, they're now safe from predation because it's not just the predators on land, but once they make it to the sea, every fish with a mouth large enough will eat a hatchling. Every bird, we're talking frigate birds, seagulls, every bird that sees a hatchling will also eat it. So they are in a lot of danger. The story does not end once they reach the water. The water is not safe. So it is only when they found that shelter that they're finally safe. And four to six years later, they're about this big. Their shells are hard. Fish can't touch them anymore. And they make their way back to land. And that is when we see these turtles swimming around and foraging in the water in the near shore. It's another 20 years before they become sexually mature and return to the beaches of Barbados.
incredible. You don't realize what exactly goes in. I mean, you hear about turtles and you hear about nesting and so on, but just what goes into it and, and, and what they have to deal with. Well, Carla was at the beach, but we've also got Carla here <laughs> to kind of, you know, further enlighten us, Carla. So that particular day that you shared with us, uh, the beach at Fitz Village, mm -hmm. what is so special about that particular site? And is it the only nesting site? No, the beach at that particular location at Fitz Village is special because the beach to the north and to the south has badly eroded. So it is a bit of an oasis in the desert mm -hmm. for turtles. So when they attempt to come up and nest in other places, they encounter wet sand and rocks and, you know, it's just very, very difficult. And then you come to this one spot at Fitz where it is significantly wider. It is an area that is not developed where people come and sit to have lunch and to hang out. I've seen weddings there. I've seen picnics. I've seen Bajans do all kinds of activities. So we love it, but because it is nice and wide and a little bit dark, our turtles love it as well. What type of turtles are we talking about? We are talking about hawksbill turtles, the most Hawks common Bill. turtle okay. on the island, yes. Right, but there are also the little green devils as well. The Don't call them ones. green devils, I, no. I, I remember who I'm talking to, but you know, <laughs> you know my, um, with green turtles, so yes. yeah. So we have the green turtles. Remember the green turtles are actually bigger than the hawksbill. So yeah. they will reach up to 450 pounds and they nest primarily on our southeast coast, but you can see juvenile green turtles all around the island. Yeah. Barbados is a nursery, essentially. Yeah, perhaps I should say playful little things rather than little devils, but they are very playful. And they're being also encouraged by the mm -hmm. tourism that we have. And I mean, you know, come feed them, come mm -hmm. swim with them and so on. So they're losing their fear of humans, I think. So we've actually had significant issues this year with uh, juvenile green turtles being struck by boats, lots of oh. propeller injuries, a uh, few of them have died, oh, no. uh, numerous of them having fish hooks because they're being provisioned with fish and then that you know increases their attraction to fish and yes. they go take bait on lines. We had a turtle that we x-rayed with three hooks um, inside of it. So we are having a lot of difficulties because turtles will normally feed at the bottom, but when they're being provisioned, persons do so at the surface. So these turtles are hanging out at the surface of the water, looking for a handout essentially. And of course, when you get your boats and your jet skis and all the other watercraft speeding by, mm -hmm. when that turtle is at the surface, there is a greater danger of a boat strike. So they don't eat fish? And I noticed you said that. No, they what do is, what not. What is their diet? Green turtles are like sea cows. They actually, grass, okay. they, well, okay. not grass, well, not but grass, sea grass. Seagrass. Yeah. Seagrass. That's what so I mean, yeah. they are supposed to be eating uh, green algae and seagrass. But I tell people this all the time. Somebody will look at me and say, but if they don't eat fish, what are you eating fish? And I'm like, well, if you put a corn curl or bread in a fish tank, your fish will eat it. That does not mean that fish are out there in the ocean baking bread. And that is what they would normally eat. They eat, like most animals, they will eat what is available and what is easy. It's much easier for them to come and take fish from your hand than to go searching, looking for green algae. Another fact of the matter is that our seagrass beds have severely diminished over yes, time. Yes, they have. So their food is not as easy to find as it once was. So this is a lot of work. Okay. So they take the easy route, which is to eat what we give them. Okay, let's continue um, our educational tour on Fitz Village with Carla. If I could be honest, for the past few years, our population has actually been contracting. So just around the time when COVID started, we started to see a dip in our numbers. And at this point, we're not really seeing 600 turtles a year. Is this the beginning of a steady decline? It's possible, but we won't know until we're able to collect more data and get a handle on what is happening with the population. Our sea turtle population in Barbados is fragile. It is balancing on the tines of a fork almost, and it only takes one nudge to push it in the wrong direction. We have two of our volunteers, Antonio and Kayla. They actually graduated from the University of the West Indies with their bachelor degrees this year. 
and they spent their summer helping to save turtles. Antonio is excavating a hatched nest. So this is a nest that the baby turtles have already emerged from. And we get critically important data from it. So we, well, he was gonna count eggshells. He's gonna open the eggs that did not hatch to see what stage of development they were at. He'll make sure that there were no stragglers left back inside of the nest. He's gonna look at the location, whether it's under vegetation or not. He'll measure the distance from the high water mark and he'll collect a significant amount of data. Right behind Antonio is actually a fresh nest that was recently laid. And they're also going to go and confirm that, draw a map, take GPS coordinates, take a number of measurements, distance from the back of the beach, distance from the high water, et cetera, et cetera. And we're going to see exactly um, what they're doing. I think Antonio has actually found some dead hatchlings. This is always a difficult area because people persist in driving straight out onto the beach. Even though there's perfectly solid, hard pavement to park on, people drive right out onto the beach and that can have a devastating impact on eggs. I mentioned before that walking on sand is not really a problem, but a car is an entirely different kettle of fish. So what happens if your volunteer Antonio mm -hmm. finds hatchlings who are still alive in, in, in the nest? It occasionally does happen and oh. when we find those hatchlings, the first thing we need to do is a health check because the nest hatched naturally, the majority of the hatchlings made their way out, these guys were left behind. So if this was a litter of puppies, we would call them the runts. So it's quite oh. possible that something may not quite be right. So we do a health check of the hatchlings. Occasionally they will have, um, they may have parasites. They may have other injuries or mutations, but once they are healthy, we will take them, we put them in a dry container and cover them with a dark towel. We transport them to our headquarters where we have a hatchling room, which is a room that is all blacked out and dark and cool. They're kept there. And then after sunset in the evening, the night patrol team will take those hatchlings to the nearest beach and release them. So we put Amazing. them on the sand on a dark beach and allow them to make their way into the ocean. Occasionally, those hatchlings may be premature. If that is the case, they go back to headquarters, but they go into our hatchling ICU. And they are looked after for a few days. We check them every day, clean them, make sure they're fine. And once they've matured and they're ready to be released, mm -hmm. then they would be released. Thank you, Carla. We're going to be back with Carla and we're going to continue our field exposition, uh, expedition, um, as we continue to look at turtle conservation right here on our island. So we're basically going to trace the steps that the hatchlings would take if they were to emerge from right here where I'm standing tonight or any night on this beach. So as they look around, first the street lights would capture their attention and they would crawl and go this way. When they get onto this hard pavement right here, some of them will get run over because Fitz Village is a relatively popular beach at night and there are people coming and going and often some of the hatchlings in this area will be crushed. They come first to this street light and you can find them congregated in the grass at the base of the light and in this area there's actually a dead hatchling right here. It's actually a bit unusual to see because we, and this is one of the saddest things that the, our team do, whenever hatchlings are killed, either in a parking area or a road, we collect them. So we will pick them up, the crushed dead hatchlings, and we will bury them on the beach. As the vehicles pass, you just hear thump, 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 thump as they're run over. 
At times we have sprinted in the middle of the road in front of cars and trying to stop traffic in order to save their lives. The ones that are lucky, or if they happen to come up at a quiet time of the night, they actually get across the road and those small openings in the sidewalk open to a, a drain or a canal and they plummet down. When I tell you plummet down, these hatchlings are about an inch long and they're falling maybe about three feet down into the canal. And then they crawl through the canal and make their way because they're still instinctively going in the direction that is brightest. They crawl through the canal and make their way over there to that drain at the bottom of the street where the light is able to shine through the grill. So the canal under the sidewalk is dark, but there's a patch of light where the grate is over the drain. So what we do, or every time I'm on fits, what we do, whether I see hatchlings dead or not, is to cross the road and take a look into the drain because you just never know. Sometimes it takes them a while to actually crawl under the sidewalk. So hatchlings may appear the day after the nest emerged when the others have already been rescued. So it's important that we keep checking and there are a number of drains like this where we need to keep checking because the sun will kill them very easily inside of the drain. The drain is actually a cement canal and there is a hatchling. I knew there was a chance. There's a hatchling. And it is moving. All right, sorry. This is a brand new net. My other net is, has, is kind of old and beat up, but I've worked, I've had that net for so many years and I've already kind of beat it into shape. So I have to just kind of bend this because the edges need, to, it needs to have some corners to help me get the hatchlings from by the wall and the rock. I've done this so many times over the years, I guess you could consider me an expert at this point. But, yeah. One baby turtle that has been saved. I'm actually going to take the dead ones out of the bucket now. I just have to hold them. And put him in. Another one. You want to see it? You want to come here? We're going to get him out. I'm actually really glad we did this interview here today instead of the West Coast because whoops, did a low runner because I don't know if we would have found these hatchlings otherwise. All right, car behind us. That's the problem with being on this drain is the risk of getting flattened. There we go. Are you alive? Yes. Very much <laughs> One out of every thousand hatchlings that make it to the sea will survive. So falling into this drain is not accounted for. Getting run over in this road is not accounted for. Being eaten by a cat or a dog, those odds are not accounted for. One out of every thousand hatchlings that make it to the sea. What we're trying to do is to stand in the gap and get them to the sea, to give them that one in a thousand chance. So tell us, the general public, um, I like how you um, said once to me, you know, see something, say something is very important in terms of the work of the Barbados Sea Turtle yes. Project. So if you could share with us briefly why it's so important, mm -hmm. talk to us quickly about the hotline and how we can get in contact with you. Okay, so essentially, and this may be the first, one of the first times I'm <laughs> I am disclosing this, our turtle population in Barbados is in decline. Oh. 
and it's something that we've only discovered in the last year or so. So the next few years are going to be critical. It is important for you to help because we cannot do it all alone. Mm -hmm. We are we have an amazing team of volunteers, but we're still just a few individuals. Turtles are nesting along our coastline. They're getting into trouble along our coastline. The species is still critically endangered. We have managed to pull our population back from the brink. We had about 50 nesting in uh, 1997, and you know we have more than quadrupled that now. Once again, we need all hands on deck if we're going to stop that population slide from going back down. So we're not sure exactly what the problem is, but there are many problems that we are aware of. And one of them is nesting females getting into difficulty, going into the road and so on, not having space to nest on our beaches because of our management of this shared resource. And we're not really sharing it. They're being ridiculously selfish when it comes to our beach chairs. I will happily call out the restaurants. They are being ridiculous as well because now everyone is doing this outdoor dining. So you have carpets, tables and chairs taking up all of the space on the beach. Remember I said that Fitz Village was an oasis. Yes. There are many of these oases where there is the sand is there, the space is there, but there's no access granted to turtles because of what we are doing with the space. So that is one of the things that is going to be critically important moving forward allowing turtles to have access to the remaining space. Climate change, we all know about that. The horizon is grim. We need to do the best with what we can. And one way that Barbadians can do that is by calling our 24-hour hotline 230-0142. I'll say it one more time, 230-0142. If you see something, even if you can't help or intervene, please call, we will respond, and we will be there as quickly as we can. Our turtles are depending not on me, they're depending on you. Thank you so much, Carla. I just, the passion that Carla and her volunteers have is special, and it's something that we should all catch on to, because turtles are Barbadians for a short bit of their lives, and they return here every so often to where they were born. And so it's, it's vitally important that when mm -hmm. we see something, we say something, and we give Carla and her colleagues a call. Thank you so much for joining us on Action for Animals, and we'll see you again next time. <laughs>